Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NASC Summer Speaker Series. Uh, I, I know it's a tough time, and uh, I hope everybody's staying healthy and safe. Uh, this is uh, the second of the three uh, series this year. Uh, uh, my name is Haifeng Qian. I'm hosting this event today. Uh, I'm the chair of NASC. Uh, actually, I'm co-hosting this event with Jason Brown. Uh, Jason will lead the Q&A session later, uh, so he will say hi to everyone. Uh, uh, Jason is a NASC counselor member as well. Uh, today, we're very delighted to have Professor Kara Kalkman uh, talk on anticipating a world of automated transport, cost, energy, and urban system implications. Uh, I'll just briefly introduce uh, Dr. Kalkman a little bit. Um, uh, Dr. Kara Kalkman is the Dewitt Greer Centennial Professor of Civil Architectural and Environmental Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Her primary research interests include planning for shared and autonomous vehicle systems, uh, the statistical modeling of urban systems, energy and climate issues, the economic impacts of transport policy, and uh, crash uh, occurrence and consequences. Uh, she has authored over 160 journal articles. Dr. Kalkman is the recipient of an NSF Career Award, Google Research Award, MIT Technology Review Top 100 Innovators Award, and several awards from the American Society of Civil Engineers and the Women's Transport Seminar. She's currently the chair of, uh, excuse me, he's currently the, currently the president of NASC. Um, a registered professional engineer, she holds a PhD, MS, and BS in civil engineering, a master's in urban planning, and a minor in economics, all from the University of California at Berkeley. Um, before uh, Professor Kalkman starts, uh, I'll just say a few words about the ground rule here. Uh, this lecture will be recorded, and the link to the lecture will be posted on the NASC website, which is narsc.org. Uh, Dr. Kalkman will give a lecture for about uh, 75 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, please post your questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. You should be able to see it on the Zoom screen. Um, uh, there's a upload. Uh, you can click upload if you like a question, so the question will be moved upward a little bit. Um, if you prefer ask questions by voice, uh, we can do that, uh, but we'll go through the uh, Q&A function uh, first. Uh, so if you want to ask uh, in person, and please wait uh, until the uh, end of the webinar to raise your hand. Um, without further ado, uh, Carol, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me in this trio. Um, I, Mark and Luke are just terrific people uh, to have uh, this summer. And I wanted to bring you up to speed on maybe the last nine years of, of some of my students' research. And so I'm going to be presenting a, a six part presentation and uh, it's going to cover about 10 different papers that we've produced, but we have many more than that in the autonomous vehicle area. And I hope this will become a big research area for regional science uh, because it does have big impacts on trade and travel which of course impact uh, a lot of the things that many of you are studying. And so we're gonna start with cost and, and, and touch on energy and just urban system implications uh, with work by Dan and Donna, Ben, Neil, Murti, and, and of course myself. Uh, so past nine years or so, and, and since I'm talking to a group of regional scientists, I'm not positive you all know what a connected vehicle is, but it's just one that broadcasts uh, some information and can hear information from other vehicles. And, and we were expecting this uh, to be required on all new model vehicles and actually kind of an easy retrofit because it was supposed to be based on this dedicated short range communication span, which is pretty easy to add uh, to vehicles or even to phones and things like that, uh, new phones, but existing vehicles. And since uh, the 2016 election was not in, in Clinton's favor, um, I think this is why we did not see this become required. So we're going to wait now to see if, if 5G, uh, which is a cellular transmission that also has uh, lots of be benefits, but um, it's going to bring infotainment into the car, which is uh, not, not nearly as useful as a basic safety message, I suppose, uh, for safety, but it, it does have other benefits. And so I guess that, that may be required at some point. And, and that's just... Um, your position, direction, speed. So other vehicles, if they have some automation on them or if there's alerts being broadcast to the driver, he or she can respond and try to avoid collisions. Um, but 
you know, there, there are other benefits to, I suppose, a traffic flow. And uh, what you guys are probably most interested in is the automated uh, vehicles. And so these can perform things on their own, like automatic um, braking for emergencies. Some of you have that on your new vehicles, which is wonderful. And then uh, lane departure warnings, that's not very automated. It's just a camera sensing something in the, the lane next to you. Uh, LIDAR adds a lot more information uh, to the radars and cameras, and so it's a bit duplicative, but it's, it's redundant and it, it helps a great deal with uh, fog situations, dust situations, things like that. So you definitely want to have redundancy, and of course automation is really helpful to you and me in, in avoiding collisions as well as not having to drive ultimately. So. There's actually five different levels or six if you include zero automation and there's basic driver assistance in blue um, under level one and level two partial. So the Tesla autopilot is, is considered a level two automation and Tesla will, will be getting as, as quickly as it can into level three, whereas other manufacturers want to skip from the blue zone, um, you know, maybe level one and skip to level four rather than letting the driver have any control because it's uh, difficult to ensure safety when there's a human in the loop. So keeping the human out of it and jumping all the way to level four is what uh, most auto manufacturers are doing around the world. Uh, Tesla's, you know, exciting and, and um, pretty innovative. So it's, it's definitely one to watch as they move through these, these different levels. And a level five means that the vehicle will go off road. It doesn't need to have a, a map or, or knowledge of the, the setting. And so most manufacturers are not planning for that, but that can be useful for military applications. Or if some of you have ranches in Texas with a lot of off-roading, I suppose level five could be useful to you, but uh, that's not expected anytime soon. It's really level four that we're looking at, and that's what I'll be talking to you about today. So uh, well-mapped settings like Austin or San Francisco or pretty much any uh, public roadway in, in the U.S. And, and many other countries. So some of you may know, uh, some of you have been in traffic crashes, perhaps all of you have been in traffic crashes, and, and they add up to a big piece of our economy, almost 5% if you consider all the pain and suffering that goes on for the victims as well as their family members. So a lot of, of costs rolled into that each year, a trillion dollars, that's about $3,000 a year per person. So that's kind of the biggest benefit of trying to make driving uh, smarter. And of course, driver error isn't a factor in almost all of those collisions and 40% and of the fatal crashes are involving alcohol, drugs, fatigue, or distraction. And of course, the hope is that the computer is never going to be drunk or uh, drugged <laughs> or tired. Uh, but of course, sensors can get dirty and, and code may be hacked if there's a remote driving option, which we don't generally recommend, but those kinds of things can create issues as well. Um, so the congestion issue is, is something people talk about a lot more. It's not worth nearly as much as the crash issue to this country and, and probably any other country, um, but it, it does have real benefits that people notice day to day. Unfortunately, uh, we're not going to see a, a lot better traffic flow and, and probably only on the freeways or very simple highways uh, until we mandate close following, so tight following by the manufacturers, which they are loath to do because their computers are working really hard, so they don't feel confident. So that kind of regulation to force vehicles to follow at a one second headway, if they're automated, is, is kind of a long way off. And then in the long term, so after the year 2050, you might have enough AVs out there, so over 95% uh, approaching any intersection or the vehicle miles traveled in, in this country or in a, a region that you could have those smart intersections. I can't have a lot of pedestrians and, and cyclists, but those smart intersections where people uh, go through in mini platoons and they're told exactly what time to arrive in what lane so that you can push mini platoons through the intersection at maybe double the capacity of current intersections. But on local streets, it's intersections and, and stop signs that control. So until you get rid of all these conventionally driven vehicles, which takes you know at least 20 years, um, and, and if you first have to have the right technology to even start this process, but to, to turn over a fleet 
Uh, conventional vehicles takes at least 20 years, but these are these are long term uh, possibilities for benefits. Another big benefit, so something we study a lot, is the fact that most of our vehicles are parked 23 hours a day. So it's a really underutilized asset. And this is just an image of when the vehicles are busy and what percentage are busy. So you'll see that we get to maybe 14% or 16% if we tend to look at the newer vehicles. Um, and I'm sure if you looked at the, you know, the vehicles that are only one or two years old, you might get up to 18 or 20% in that 5 to 6 p.m. hour, which is the busiest hour of the day. So maybe one out of every five of the newest vehicles are in use at that time. This is with buffers that we've put on the departure and arrival times of U.S. household vehicles. So this is actually a very conservative, uh, so, but most vehicles are sitting still, even at the busiest time of the day. So this is kind of a wasted asset. So one naturally thinks of car sharing. Uh, and then, of course, we all know that there's lots of seats going by empty in the vehicles that are out there. So ride sharing with strangers, not just with family and friends, but ride sharing becomes a really uh, interesting opportunity. So like mini buses, basically, if you're going to be ordering a ride in a fleet. And of course, many of you have already tried this many times with Uber Pool and Lyft Line and maybe Diddy in in China and of course Singapore has an excellent service too. So there's there's not just the Uber and Lyft that many of us have on our phones, but these these other apps as well around the world. And of course the elderly and the disabled and probably some kids are pretty excited about this opportunity for like ordering a, a vehicle uh, so that they can get where they need to go. If you have epilepsy, you're not allowed to drive generally from what I understand. And um, so this is something that allows you to have that mobility. Or if you feel uncomfortable driving at night because of your eyesight, suddenly you've, this opens a lot of doors for you. Uh, if we have fewer vehicles, that means it opens up a lot of parking downtown, which can be much better utilized than a, a seated vehicle. Uh, you may be allowed to also summon your vehicle and have it park itself, but I don't recommend that unless it is part of a fleet that's professionally operated and avail uh, the managers are available 24 seven if the vehicle gets caught up in something. I, I really don't recommend that you and I be allowed to send our vehicles to, to you know, go find a parking space because congestion's bad enough. So that's a real issue if, if we allow privately owned vehicles to go drive themselves around empty. And there's latent and, and induced vehicle miles traveled. So that's what this acronym VMT means, vehicle miles traveled. By making driving easier because the vehicle drives itself, we're going to be inducing a lot of additional travel. And of course, there's already a lot of pent up demand out there, maybe by uh, persons with disabilities and, and the aged. There's freight movement applications. Many of you do work in this area. I highly recommend you take a look at the, the cost structure for self-driving vehicles. It makes great uh, sense on long distance trips because uh, there may be an operator on board, but he or she can sleep or do office work and is there for the pickups and deliveries as well as any crashes or anything that may happen along the way. This is an expensive asset, that, that heavy duty vehicle. It keeps the vehicle running, so instead of only 100,000 miles a year for uh, the standard heavy duty truck, you can get 200,000 uh, miles per year or more from that kind of use. And yeah, a lot of, of commercial entities are interested in saving some more gasoline, even though gas is incredibly cheap in this country, it is still a big piece of the, the expenditures for uh, fleet managers on the, on the freight movement side of the, the ledger. So our first work was just trying to quantify what are these things worth? You know, we subsidize electric vehicle ownership or purchase to some extent. Uh, should these things be uh, promoted heavily? And so we started thinking about um, early, early introduction. So this is just a 10% market share. And if they save, you know, maybe 70% of crashes a year, how many um, lives across this fleet in the U.S. would be saved. So we lose about 35,000 people every year to collisions on public roads, and so we might save about 1. or 1,000 a year um, by having a 10% market share. They can't avoid all collisions, of course. People can hit them, and and they can, you know, uh, people can run in front of them, and all they can do is try to slow down faster than you or I can, but they still may, you know, injure that person or possibly kill them. So they're not going to take care of all 10% of, of fatalities right away. 
Uh, the economic savings of those crashes is certainly worth something as well as the comprehensive. And you can see the comprehensive is worth about three times as much as the, the pure economic, which it would be uh, people who have jobs who were unable to get to them. And, and of course, the medical costs and the car repair costs, those are all included in the economic damages. And then there's congestion. There's hours per year uh, saved from a, a fleet in the US. So this is about 756 million hours and 102 million gallons. And then what is that worth um, at you know, an average value of time and, and fuel and, and maybe uh, $1,320 per year per AV. So uh, this is per vehicle in this case, or vehicle year, like I showed it up there. So that's a big benefit right there. Um, it's, it's not quite as big as the comprehensive benefits from the, the crash savings, but it's pretty significant just to start having some smarter vehicles in the mix, especially on the freeways where they can smooth some of the stop and go behaviors and over braking that we see because they can hear from some of the other vehicles ahead of them what's going on. They don't have to just pay attention to the vehicle right in front of them. And then there's parking savings, perhaps. Uh, so if the vehicle can and is allowed to park itself, you might save about $250 per vehicle per year uh, on those vehicles. But I don't recommend, like I said earlier, letting private vehicles do that. There will be added vehicle miles traveled because these things um, may be driving empty some of the time and people may be making longer trips or more people may be having access to the driving option, as I mentioned earlier. But because some of the fleet would be shared, you might see a reduction in the total number of vehicles. They're just working harder. That's how you get the vehicle miles traveled increase while the total number goes down. And as we increase the market share to 50% or 100%, you see these, or excuse me, 90%, you see these numbers uh, bop around a bit. And in the 90% case, you know, we were assuming one out of every 10 vehicles would be, or AVs would be shared, and, and that would be shared among maybe nine different travelers rather than you know one vehicle per adult uh, as we have in the US right now. And so um, maybe about a 10% increase in vehicle miles traveled, but uh, this was an early study. And now that we've actually run the models with congestion feedbacks and travel behavior, we're seeing about a 25% increase in total VMT, which could really gridlock uh, almost any any reasonably sized city uh, at peak times of day. Uh, Austin's already gridlocked in the afternoon downtown, and I think many of you live in cities where you see that. So um, we, we really don't want to go that high. Even if they're forced to follow at tighter headways, it doesn't do much on the local streets. That really is only beneficial on the, the freeways. And to get those smart intersections working, you're probably going to need to get to 100% market share or, or very close to it in your city. So the next thing we did is said, okay, well, that's what these vehicles may be worth socially. It's a, a fair, fair amount, but let's look at it privately. So if you're the person uh, who's paying and, and receiving the benefits, uh, and to maybe this was you know eight years ago that we wrote this first paper, if you had to pay $100,000 to get that automation added to whatever vehicle you're presently driving, so the cost of the technology, would that be worth it to you? What if in the long term, as many analysts are expecting something about like a $3,000 cost? And this is what the Tesla might uh, be asking right now. Of course, Tesla doesn't put LiDAR on top of its vehicles. That's a pretty expensive technology, uh, but they do upgrade their software overnight through Wi-Fi really, um, and they've got lots of cameras and radar on there that they think are adequate for many settings. Um, so that's, if you check the box on the Tesla website, you might be paying that to add uh, the capability, but the hardware is already on your Tesla if you own one. So not too many people would benefit um, at these early stages, uh, especially if they really don't value maybe having the vehicle self-park or having it um, drive itself, which is hard to imagine. Most of us would be willing to pay somebody $5 an hour to chauffeur us around, uh, or maybe even $10 an hour. So that's what the second term is for. This is the parking benefit on a work day, and then the second term would be the value of, of time saved. So uh, a lot of people would much rather look at their phone or sleep or, or do something else while they're en route and being chauffeured by the vehicle. And so that gets us into the green over here with these returns on the investment, the ROI. Lots of assumptions underneath this, of course, and I, I hope you'll take a look at that paper if, if you're interested. We also have another paper about uh, the 
economic impacts to different industries. And so this was an undergraduate in um, mechanical engineering named Louis Clements, who basically had to read a lot of literature to get a sense about what those in the auto industry or auto insurance industry versus land development industry. It's a, that's a huge industry for this nation, you know, almost a trillion per year in industry revenue. So if you have a bit of an impact there, it, it really ends up being high dollar per capita in this country. Uh, but the highest per capita was the auto insurance. Um, you're still gonna need to insure your vehicle because a tree can fall on it, a bicyclist, forgive me, a bicyclist can crash into it. I've seen that happen. A drunk bicyclist crashed into a, a Prius parked on the street next to where I was walking one day. So bad things can happen. And of course you can still hit somebody. Your vehicle can still hit somebody. Um, may not be its fault, but you know, a lot of these are, are no fault uh, collision cases. And so that's maybe a $300 per capita per year impact. It's a reduction in cost for that industry uh, but the OEMs are, are deep pockets and they will be having to carry uh, that, that kind of collision uh, cost. So they um, you know, may be spending a lot on top attorneys for very complicated cases when those collisions do occur. Freight is another big industry, of course, big impacts there. And it kind of goes down the line, whether they're winners or losers in terms of the revenues, but it's mostly a win for all of us as consumers, I think. And at the end of the day, it's, you know, it has impacts if you take the absolute values of about $1,300 per person per year in the long term, if everything were kind of automated or auto, autonomous capable. And then we said, well, that didn't really take into account the productivity benefits of your and my not having to drive. That's not a, an industry that we can point to, but boy, that is worth a lot of money. So that is almost $1,500 per capita per year. And this is, you know, kids too, people who don't drive. Uh, so this is per person in this nation. And then the collision savings, um, but we had some double counting there on the collision because of the, the industry that, that services those vehicles. So when we subtract off that double counting, we're at almost $4,000 per person per year in this country of impact. Okay, both positive and negative in terms of saving more and paying more, but yeah, very, very big impacts from automation of our fleet if that happens, you know, in the next uh, 30 to, to 40 years. So the things we do is, well, who would even adopt these things? Who are early adopters and uh, how much will they use them if they have a vehicle that has dual mode? So it can be conventionally driven, a, what we call a human driven vehicle, or it's an autonomous vehicle, so an HV or an AV. Um, and then we also had electric vehicles in this big survey. And so this was back in 2017, almost 1,500 people across the, the continental US, as well as, of course, Hawaii, Alaska, and even Puerto Rico. And we weight the respondents because they tend to be more educated. And usually we'll get a gender bias. On this one, I think it was female, which is kind of interesting um, because males are often associated with high tech stuff. but we got a, a lot of females very interested in this survey. And so we just um, balance for that before we report any statistics or run any regression models. And we asked them, you know, what do they currently own and what are they planning to own? When do they think they might let go of a vehicle? Will the new vehicle maybe be electric depending on the prices that we offer the respondent, um, self-driving, maybe a shared fleet. And so we call, um, so you've got your electric vehicles, your connected autonomous vehicles, your shared autonomous vehicles. See, this is like a self-driving taxi or the Lyft fleet being automated or GM Cruise, for example. And then there's dynamic ride sharing, and that's where you're sharing the ride and route. You're not just sharing the vehicle after you've used it, you're sharing the ride while you are in route. So that's a pretty important opportunity for us to, to tame some of the emissions, the congestion, and of course the costs. And so all these questions became fodder for a bunch of econometric models that allowed us to do a, a micro simulation of households across the nation and the fleet evolution. Little things off the top of the survey, you find like about a third of the um, Americans were, were preferring an autonomous vehicle as their next vehicle if there was no cost difference. And they do prefer to have the dual mode. So they're willing to pay, you know, 
probably a thousand dollars more to get that dual mode capability and if they have it they're only going to use the autonomous capability for about a third of their driving which is interesting to me i mean if i find it drives well I, i'm going to be stuck using it i i really don't need to have my hands on that wheel that's that's a burden i'm, I'm not very interested in but some people like driving or they think they do i, I think they're going to give it up a lot faster than these respondents were guessing and then we asked them things like, you know, if the shared autonomous vehicle fleets can be ordered at 50 cents per mile versus the standard $2 per mile that we pay right now for Uber and Lyft and $3 per mile for taxis in this country, uh, well, what will they do? What kind of shift do they expect? And, and some people say, you know, they're just going to let go of, of their own personal vehicle, but not too many. That's that first row here. You only see about 4.4% ready to throw in the towel on private vehicle ownership. Um, but another 4% say, yeah, but I'll, I'll also be biking and walking, of course. And then um, here's 12.5% in green for mostly use SAVs, but still own maybe one vehicle or more for the household's um, other activities. And then, um, you know, they may be worried that the SAVs aren't going to come very quickly. They can't um, guarantee their arrival in certain situations, especially if they they live in a, a hurricane coastal region where they're worried about evacuating and they need one vehicle to shepherd themselves and their, their uh, pets and belongings out. Um, but yeah, most people, I'm afraid, the biggest category was the no SAV use. Uh, maybe they're scared you know, of this technology. And about 44 cents per mile across the whole uh, set of respondents weighted, of course. This is a weighted number, population weighted. And that's a really interesting number to me because you're going to see in a later slide, this is what it actually costs to provide that service, uh, about 45 cents per mile when we used a Prius with the technology on top of it. Uh, we also tested versus uh, like the Chevrolet Bolt, which is an all electric vehicle and where we have to uh, charge the battery pretty frequently um, to, or, you know, a couple times a day rather than maybe filling the, the tank once a day for a fleet of shared autonomous vehicles. And about 40 or 50% were willing to do some ride sharing um, at a 40% discount. And of course, we see this all the time in Chicago, San Francisco, many other places where they have a good, a high demand for shared rides and a high demand for these uh, ride hailing apps. And so we, we do see that kind of discount already happening on, the, on these apps. Uh, but even though a lot of them are willing to do it, some of the time, um, only, you know, about 19% are saying yes, every, you know, of, of all the trips I'm making, about 19% will be ride sharing. So it's just a fifth. And we also have some things like whether they'll be going downtown more often because the parking becomes easier when you don't have to bring your own vehicle. And of course, you can uh, maybe drink a, a bit of alcohol and come home safely. In, a, in one of these autonomous taxis. I did ask them about empty travel because I am very worried about congestion and most Americans um, don't really think about the policy implications of these things. And so um, they said, well, you can't drive empty all the time, but 20% is fine with my private vehicle or with you know, a fleet vehicle. That will be really hard to enforce, I have to say. Um, and then 25% are sort of like uh, me, at least on, I feel on the private vehicle side, no empty travel except in emergencies unless you're part of a fleet. And so they, they, they are worried about driving. So we've, we use a, a suite of econometric models to micro simulate the, the fleet ownership all the way and the fleet use all the way through 2050. And um, we had different scenarios for how quickly the price of that technology would fall, as well as the willingness to pay, which we do expect to rise as people see this technology performing well and their neighbors coming home alive <laughs> from trips that they've been in autonomous vehicles that we do expect, just like with your smartphone, that the willingness to pay will rise over time, maybe at a, a couple percent per year. Here's a flowchart of some of the decisions being made. We also had that electric vehicle powertrain decision. We have the new versus used hybrids and diesels and plug-in hybrids, as well as battery only electric vehicles. Um, whether their willingness to pay for the automation was high enough to, to pass the price premium that the OEMs are charging in that year. And so whether they add it to the, the vehicle that they're about to buy and whether it's a uh, dual mode so they can also it has a steering wheel it has a uh, brake 
lifts and, and, and gas pedals so that they can still drive it on their own if they want to uh, practice driving. You know, maybe they have another car that's conventional, so they don't want to lose that skill or they, they plan to take a trip to uh, Peru where they're going to rent a vehicle that might be conventionally driven or something. So they, they want to maintain that driving skill because you can lose that pretty quickly if you are in all autonomous mode. Uh, this is what the, the Waymo engineers say anyhow when they get into a regular car after being driven around. Um, it is a little frightening. So we also looked at their willingness uh, to move closer to the city center or further from the city center based on having an autonomous vehicle and these are people we focused on who were already planning to move and so we thought that they had a better sense of what they might do and interestingly about seven percent said they'd move closer to the city center and about eight percent or nine percent said they they thought they would probably move further away maybe because the vehicle could drive them to work while they sleep each day so the driving wouldn't bother them but the those moving closer to the city center i guess these on the left here are probably people thinking that, hey, there's going to be SAVs. I don't need to own a vehicle. I can have an apartment and walk around and, and use these other modes in the future. So um, I'm, I'm willing to kind of go onto a smaller parcel without all that parking and driveway space. So these are numbers in 2035 and 2050 uh, for these six of the seven different scenarios that I was mentioning. There's a 5% annual decline in the price of the technology Plus, it can be driven by a human. So this is a human-driven vehicle. It's capable of both. So if the vehicles that are being manufactured have both capabilities on board, that's uh, important for adoption. And it actually results in, in higher levels adoption. And if the price of the technology declines faster, and so 10% per year, uh, your phone, by the way, if you have the same capability phone over time, it'd be about a 7.5% decline per year. So these are based on actual you know, technologies that we've seen over time declining. So somewhere in this ballpark is, is, is what happens for the same technology. Of course, our phones are getting better. So you don't really see this at the, the Sprint store when you go in to get the, your next phone. But um, that's where we, we got, you know, the biggest percentage of AVs versus only human driven capability um, by the year 2035. And, and part of this is because you know, a lot of people are still owning conventional vehicles right now. You can't turn the fleet over that quickly. Uh, by 2050, you might get to 84% in the most optimistic of these cases. Uh, so you're still having um, 15 or 16% that are only human driven capability. And, and by that point, I think, I hope our government is going to have a rule that no new vehicles can be conventionally driven. Uh, you can buy them and drive them on a racetrack, just like you can take a horse to a special park and, and ride that horse, but they would no longer be permitted on public roads in, in almost all settings. Maybe on Sunday mornings from seven to eight in the morning, you could drive your car around just like people do with their, their old vehicles these days, but um, in general, no. And so that human vehicle capability, that option of being able to also drive, um, so a bimodal kind of uh, drivetrain on that vehicle is, is helpful except that then the miles driven on those vehicles are not um, so much autonomous and, and so it's not just what's in your uh, driveway it's also what's on the road how are the vehicles being driven in front of you and so here's an image of those adoption rates over time we didn't allow the autonomous vehicles to start selling until 2025 directly to the consumer. We're starting to see a little bit of shared autonomous vehicle fleets emerging in this five-year period in key cities for those who are lucky enough to get them, but they won't be selling to the public directly for you know another five to 10 years probably. Although Tesla is, it surprises us. So Tesla could push this, this dark blue line up. And of course this dark blue line is the most uh, the most generous or optimistic. And there's a new scenario that's been added here. This is the, the less optimistic price reduction, but in the year 2035, the feds, so the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration says, no more, it's, it's not ethical to allow humans to drive anymore. This is, they're killing other people's kids. They're killing their own kids. We're not gonna let them drive anymore. So all new vehicles at that point have to be autonomous only. And that's cheaper, by the way, than buying a vehicle that can be self-driven as well as have, um, you know, a, a steering wheel and all this other gear on board. So if that happens, then you see that kink in the year 2035 propel this up so it starts to compete. 
But still, if you're worried about all autonomous vehicles in the year 2050, these scenarios don't show it. Uh, you will need some policy making in these years to, to scrap or retire those, those uh, conventionally driven vehicles. And then the mileage splits, what's on the road, not just what's in the driveway. So again, these, these six scenarios, the main scenarios and the year 2035 as well as the year 2050. But we've got four columns devoted to the year 2035 now because some of these miles that are being driven on the roadway are in the shared fleets and others are in the privately held fleets. Uh, I don't know that most manufacturers are going to sell a privately owned vehicle because they don't trust you and me, uh, at least not right now, to maintain the sensors and to uh, take the risk that they, they would like to, us to carry. Uh, so Tesla owners I think carry most of that crash risk, um, but those are complex cases when they do crash. Uh, they do crash at a lower rate uh, because of all the automation. Um, but yeah, it's, this is going to be tricky whether they really are going to sell to us. If they do, if they do sell to us, though, you know, there's going to be a fair amount of driving in the year 2035 that is still conventionally driven. So this is human driven, uh, and maybe about just 16% would be in the shared fleet. If we go to the year 2050, we're talking about 35% in the shared fleet and most of it in the privately held fleet. Um, but if they if they don't sell to us directly and, and Tesla doesn't make you know some major um, sales numbers, then you know we we might have mostly in the shared fleet if you're going to be autonomously driven. So it does depend on the manufacturers, not just on our price decline and willingness to pay assumptions. So. The private SAVUs, this means that you are not sharing the ride and route. You're not using dynamic ride sharing. It's, it's just for you and your family members or whoever um, you're traveling with. If, if you're traveling with somebody else, it's more popular uh, right now than the, the shared ride. And, and that's unfortunate given congestion issues. But if we start using congestion pricing, especially credit-based congestion pricing, which I highly recommend, then you can um, see that ride sharing start to take off. So this is just a part two conclusion, but we don't see Americans being willing to share very much right now. If they, they have a lot of money, um, you know, they buy a lot of crazy vehicles right now, big pickup trucks that they don't need, things that are very expensive. And, um, you know, they, they are willing to buy their own vehicle rather than share it and, and not have to deal with maintenance and, and parking and that kind of thing. Um, you're probably going to need the proactive policies to limit some of that uh, empty driving, whether it's from the private vehicle fleet or it's from the shared vehicle fleet. Um, the price drops and that willingness to pay assumption are pretty important um, to how quickly this, this fleet turns over. Uh, interestingly, a sprawl was not affected in any big way. So those home location choices were not affected in a big way. But we didn't simulate the changing de demographics, so our population is aging, and that can certainly affect results. Uh, we just kept the population kind of constant and let, let these households move forward through time without aging. We also did another survey um, soon after that one. This one, we, we focused on long distance travel impacts and ride sharing, so nighttime versus daytime, um, do your, does your family know where you are? Have you, you sent, shared your location with them? These kinds of things. Also privacy and crash ethics because those questions had not been answered before. This was our fifth survey actually on this, on the topic of AVs. So um, we, we answered almost every question we can think of. So we were really um, asking some new questions here. Uh, safety was the major benefit, but yet they weren't really sure that AVs were safe enough or, or will be safe enough is, is still you know big concern for adoption and a fair number of us know people who could really make use of of these autonomous vehicles especially the shared fleet you don't have to own it you just pay by the mile and about 63 percent in this case were willing to share a ride um, as long as they were, it wasn't going to slow them down on a five mile trip and it was daytime uh, but, you know, another 8% will opt in if you can have criminal background checks. So some of us might say, yeah, feel free to check my background. I, I'm clean. And um, maybe that'll give me more uh, shared ride opportunities with others. And there, very few were willing to say at this point in time that they're going to share rides with strangers at night. But of course, in San Francisco and, and other places, Chicago, there is a, a fair amount of ride sharing that's still going on at night, higher than that, among the people who are using Uber and Lyft. 
of course, many people are not using Uber and Lyft yet. So uh, this is a, that would be a biased group. And yeah, depending on how much we delay them, that, that kind of thing certainly affects adoption, sharing their location with uh, family and friends. And of course, that's very easy to do with the cell phone you have right now in your pocket. So it's not something special that the apps need to add. Um, among those who are willing to share rides, they're willing to pay a lot. These are people who probably don't have a car or are not permitted to drive uh, at certain times of day, that kind of thing. And then the average shared ride duration was pretty long. You know, once they, they get in the vehicle, it's, it's fine with them if it's on average up to 40 minutes. So um, that was nice to see. Uh, we asked about crash ethics, who's responsible, what should the vehicle do if it's about to hit something and they, um, so if you have that it's definitely going to crash into a group of pedestrians, they, you know, whether it, it change, swerves left or right or goes straight ahead, they say just go straight ahead <laughs> for the most part. And, um, you know, don't try to, to guess uh, based on race or gender, age, these kinds of things. Just ignore that. Um, really make it about maybe the number of people who are going to be injured or killed, depending on your trajectory. But mostly just stay in, in, um, in your lane, you know, like you might normally do unless you can really avoid a fair amount of damage. And then this last question here, who's responsible? Um, most are going with the manufacturer, which makes sense, but some people want to go after the programmer. Of course, there's a lot of programmers involved in this very intense code. And then we looked at things like a multinomial logic here for um, the mode choice. Um, and we had airplane option, of course. Um, these would be trips over 300 miles typically, but we have some distance categories, as you can see among our covariates. And vehicle ownership, household size, these ended up being important. And these are uh, kind of like uh, elasticities that we're reporting here. We're not showing you the betas. Those wouldn't be very helpful to you, but we're showing you how uh, the percentage of of one standard deviation change basically, or maybe the change in the, the mode split here for autonomous vehicle privately owned versus shared versus airplane. So AVs, of course you can also drive your own conventional car, but these are gonna get a big um, bumps in, in the future, I think, uh, and the airplane's gonna lose share. So we have a, a couple papers about long distance travel besides this, this question that we were asking in this particular survey. And it's very interesting, in fact, here in Texas, all of these, uh, the Texas Triangle and, and markets within Texas basically are decimated by the arrival of autonomous vehicles because you can, you don't have to book two weeks in advance. You could leave at any time. You don't go through security. You go door to door. Uh, you may have to stop for refueling en route, <laughs> but otherwise it's a pretty good mode. Uh, the biggest thing that we're known for, I think, here at UT with my students is looking at fleets of shared autonomous vehicles and how they operate. And like I mentioned earlier, most vehicles are sitting still most times of the day, almost all day long. Uh, some vehicles aren't even used uh, most days of the month in this country. So, um, you know, car sharing programs have been doing all right in, in big cities. So people don't have to pay for parking and, and worry about those vehicles too much, except when they need them. But the shared autonomous vehicles give you that nice um, reduction in walk distance to access the vehicle. And if you let go of the vehicle while you're shopping or working, there'll be a vehicle to come get you at the end of the day. You don't have to worry about somebody else stealing your vehicle, okay, because you don't own it. It's a shared fleet. And so we started about nine years ago just simulating this small town. It was 10 miles by 10 miles, and it had streets on a grid system every quarter mile. And we let the um, vehicles pick uh, passengers and, and start heading to them every five minutes. And because we were coding this ourselves, it was, it was difficult. Um, we made it look like the, the core of Austin, but we didn't give it, you know, the street network and the, the land use patterns that Austin had. We had um, average densities kind of starting high in the center and, and falling towards the, the periphery. And so this is what it looks like uh, on a 124 hour day um, with a Poisson generation of those trips. So it's pretty random, but obviously concentrated in the center. And we had mostly round trips because that's what Americans tend to do 78% of the time. And depending, you know, they would come back or head somewhere else uh, depending on what time of day they departed. So their dwell times and, and their trip distances all came from the National Household Travel Surveys. And then we didn't endogenize congestion on this. We just said, okay, we know what the speeds are. They're lower during the peak periods of day, which is PK or peak. 
and they're, they're higher in the off peak, which is OP, so that you saw that acronym up here. And um, then we let this play out. The, the central five miles was where the speeds were lowest, um, especially at the peak times of day. And this is just one vehicle who started kind of near the center of the region uh, at, at, at midnight, I guess, or maybe 3 a.m. is when we started the simulation. And you can see this vehicle moving all over the place, serving about 40 trips that day with the blue lines going to pick up and drop off. And then the red lines are for positive relocation. So if the vehicle felt that there were too many other SAVs in its neighborhood, it's a two mile by two mile neighborhood that worked best for this, um, it, it would try to go to uh, another neighborhood that had excess uh, demand anticipated versus the supply of SAVs at that time. And so this is all centrally managed. These are not human drivers saying yes or no to I'll pick up this person or I won't pick up this person. This is a, a central manager telling this vehicle where it needs to go. And that's one of the benefits of AVs is uh, you don't have to negotiate with a, a human driver. This vehicle ended right about where it started. That's strange. That doesn't usually happen. But pretty busy day, pretty random. A little bit of um, response time savings by having the, the red arrows, those relocations, but it does add empty vehicle miles traveled to your fleet. And, you know, we noticed that it, depending on how many um, trips each vehicle in, in the household fleet makes a day, it looks like it could replace almost 10 conventional vehicles, but this was a small town and a, a real region, the, the trips are gonna be longer. And so it'll be harder to hit that one to 10 replacement rate. Um, the average wait times were about 0.3 minutes, but because we had those five minute horizons, we added another two and a half minutes to this average wait time because people would want to take a trip at any moment. They wouldn't wait until those five minute uh, points were reached. And so that's why it looks about 2.8 minutes. About 11% uh, of the miles traveled were empty um, or added from the relocation. And then the emissions were reduced, even though we were adding travel distance because we used a Toyota Camry. We didn't use the typical uh, American vehicle and um, the engines were kept warm. So those catalytic converters and those engines were giving us fewer emissions, especially at the start of trips because the engine wasn't cold. And then there was also some embodied energy and emission savings by not having to build as much parking for this, this new town where everything was a shared autonomous vehicle. Uh, the biggest reductions were the volatile organic compounds and the carbon monoxide, but you got some reductions in greenhouse gases as well, even though they were driving further. And so we said, okay, let's take it up a notch. Let's do a 12 mile by 24 mile uh, region with this, this same code, but we're gonna use the real land use patterns uh, for this center part of Austin. This is the I-35 corridor, by the way, snaking from Canada to Mexico. So there's a lot of activity along that corridor. And it's a real network, but we still have an endogenized congestion. We're just taking real travel times every hour to, to estimate how long it's gonna take that vehicle to get from the pickup to the drop off. And of course we have buffers. It takes you know several minutes to get the person into the car and, and get the door closed and the seatbelt on and, and pull out of the parking space and these kinds of things. So this is all in there. You also have to refuel during the course of the day. Um, and so this is, you know, how this vehicle sort of flew around. It was using those travel times from the real network, but it looks pretty similar uh, to what we saw earlier. This is 12 miles by 24 miles though. So this is quite a bit bigger, still very constrained for most Americans uh, who live on the periphery and are making a fair number of trips each day, but way crazier than what I would be doing. Um, of course, <laughs> especially during COVID, we are, uh, you know, no vehicles do this unless you're a delivery driver for favor, let's say. Maybe you, you could do something like this with your day. And so we, we bumped up the numbers. Uh, we were running this on desktop machines. So the, the highest number that Dan was serving was 270,000 trips a day. And still wait times were under three minutes. Um, they, you had um, a one to 10 vehicle replacements still if you had dynamic ride sharing enabled. So he was allowing people to travel with strangers if it didn't increase their travel time by more than 10% or, or more than five minutes. So both of those were constraining. If you didn't wanna let any, share your ride with anybody, then maybe a one to eight vehicle replacement for people who, who 
basically stayed within this region. Um, didn't ever try to head to Dallas or Houston. That would be a different vehicle rental, I guess. And he started pricing it out. And there was a big return on a, a $1 per mile fare, assuming that the technology cost about $25,000 to add to the vehicle. So that's a lot. That's a lot more than Tesla is suggesting, right? Uh, Tesla does not have LiDAR on it. But so this is pretty early in the adoption of these vehicles or the arrival of these vehicles. You can make about a 20% profit margin on that fare. And then Donna tried doing all electric vehicles. So she had to also locate the charging stations. And she tried a, a long range vehicle, which was just 200 miles at the time. So less than what most Model S or maybe all Model S owners will get from their battery and an old Leaf. So a Nissan Leaf with just 60 miles range on it um, before it needed recharging. And she did a big region, again, gridded. So, uh, but we wanted to see, you know, if we stress this, if we allow people to make those long trips that many Americans make each week, um, is this not gonna perform so well? But it, it did perform very similarly. And again, with the emissions, you can imagine the electric vehicles did better. Um, pretty much every uh, grid operating in the US now, the electric vehicles will do better if, you know, especially if they charge at night, which is when many of these can charge because that's when they're not in use. Um, but a lot of them also charge in the afternoon before that peak period hits in the afternoon. Um, so they're charging twice a day. Uh, when the sun is high here in Texas, so you can make use of renewables, hopefully, at that point. Um, the ride sharing, of course, would save even more emissions, and we even got vehicle miles traveled to fall. So even though the vehicles are empty a lot of the time as they go between um, a drop-off and a pickup, because of the ride sharing, we were able to get total vehicle miles traveled to fall in that fleet. And then we said, of course, what did we do the whole region? So here we had to borrow code from Europe. So our friends at ETH Zurich and I think Berlin um, have wonderful code called MAPSIM and we were able to do the whole six county region. So nobody was allowed to head to New York or maybe Houston, but um, they got pretty much all their business done most weeks um, and we, we were able to go down and micro simulate at the level of, of households. So we had addresses along each street for pickup and drop off of, of these, these persons and we were using all electric vehicles much of the time and comparing it to a hybrid electric vehicle fleet, which performs just like a, a conventional drivetrain, but you get better fuel economy, right? So my Prius gets 50 miles per gallon, but these guys get over 100 miles per gallon, okay? So uh, my husband's Tesla Model 3 um, gets 130 miles per gallon or more. And you don't need uh, an attendant to fill your vehicle with gasoline, you, you need kind of a close um, inductive charging there or maybe a robotic arm that will save you some money. You still have to inspect your fleet during the day. So you've got the shared vehicle, you've got this inductively or robotically charged vehicle, and, um, and then you've got this self-driving vehicle. So that's what this equation means here. Um, and of course, like Donna, Ben had to generate those stations. And so he basically uh, generated a, a charging station uh, wherever a vehicle was going to run out of a range if it was trying to serve the next trip and then get back to one of the existing charging stations. So on a 24-hour day, we created a lot of charging stations. And then he ran it for 30 days to see if some of those charging stations were underutilized, and they were. So he shed the underutilized stations. This is pretty simple heuristic, okay? For all you operations research types, I know you can do better than this. Um, but he, he let go of those charging stations that were underutilized and then ran it and it, it worked really well. Um, so that's where he kept those charging stations, but it is more complicated than running a gasoline fleet where you only need to fuel up at night because these vehicles are going about 200 to maybe 400 miles per day, depending on uh, what your geofence is. So what, you know, is it a whole region or is it a, a city or a downtown? Um, so 200 to 400 miles a day generally. And here's where the charging stations were for these two different cases. So remember, this does depend on range. And the one on the left, there's not many charging stations. That's because that's the 200 mile range vehicle. Um, they could survive and not get stranded with just that many charging stations. But of course, you give a smaller range fleet, you're going to need a lot more charging stations. 
Either way, I recommend this, this right side image. I recommend that you put smaller charging stations all over the place. You don't want your Teslas or whatever you're using to go chasing those charging stations. You want them to find them quickly and get on with their day. And so as long as you've got good power supply in those locations for DC fast charging, or you have a battery on site, especially in expensive energy locations like Hawaii and California, Tesla will put a lot of batteries on site so it doesn't have to pull that many electrons from the grid at once. Um, keep them, you know, but out here in Burnhead and Marble Falls, there's just one to serve. And all these people are getting served. We're serving all their trips basically with this new code, which was running second by second. Uh, it had con congestion endogenous. It was dynamic traffic assignment. It's called MATSIM. And so we uh, had stations all over the place. Here's where uh, the 60 mile range vehicles had their stations kind of randomly placed downtown. And you can move these stations. You can take this one and say, oh, I can't find anything right there. This is all heavily developed and move it a couple blocks and you'll be able to find an old unused alley and underused you know, underused alley or something else. Um, train station tracks, these are very ugly. A lot of people don't want to develop next to them. You go underneath there with your charging stations. Um, so there's, there's a lot you can do there. But of course, you have to make sure you have power supply. And in commercial zones, you generally have very good power supply. But as you head out, it, it becomes hit or miss. Um, so we wanted to take a look at, at how these different fleets were operating, whether it was the short range or the long range vehicle, and whether it was a slow charge, which took four hours, or a fast charge, 30 minutes. And this is compared to the hybrid, the Prius, that we added automation to. And the Prius only takes like two minutes to refuel. You know, you have to find a a gas station, but there's a lot of them, and you have to pay some guy to come out or some gal to come out and fill it up for you, rather than, you know, this four-hour robotic arm, <laughs> this 30-minute robotic arm. So you only needed 19 gas stations to manage that hybrid fleet, and you need, you know, 155 stations to kind of manage this slow charge fleet. And we, we kept the, that 155 for all of these scenarios um, so that the, the long range vehicles weren't chasing the stations around. Um, and then the fleet size, we tried to be equitable um, with that. And you can see that even though we were equitable with that fleet size, uh, we did have a cheap uh, alternative here at the end. It was the fast charge long range, but we cheaped out on the size of the fleet. And that hurts us in terms of trips that we can't serve, 15% of trips were unserved because the person had to wait more than 30 minutes. So um, that's that's no good, right? Uh, let me go back here. This is only 2.6% of trips um, not served within 30 minutes if we used that 200 mile range, 30 minute charging uh, fleet. And you can go faster that and longer range than that, of course, uh, but batteries are expensive and they are heavy. Uh, if we did the hybrid, we only had to, you know, I guess, say you provide free trips or something to these this 1.6 percent of people whose trips were not served in 30 minutes so you can give them credits or, or whatever whatever you like um, but most people will find an, an alternative if they're if the estimated wait time is that long um, and the, the trips per day they were only serving about 25 to maybe 30 although the cheap uh, the cheap fleet was serving 35 person trips per day and, and these were persons traveling solo, but they often would share rides. So ride sharing was enabled here if it made sense for the passenger. And the wait times uh, were about five minutes for the best two scenarios um, and probably too long for the other scenario. So that was kind of interesting. Um, we've been getting better wait times with some of our more recent uh, simulations. I guess we're getting smarter about uh, how we allocate the fleet to the, the people who are calling in. And then we have, uh, you know, some empty travel. So this is unoccupied, so the vehicle is unoccupied, and um, there's some travel that has to, to get you to the gas station or to the, the charging station. So you can see those numbers. Uh, but fleet size was pretty key. And the charge times also pretty key. So I definitely gonna recommend the 200 mile range and the fast charge. Definitely gonna recommend that. And you'll see in a second here too why it makes sense financially. So lots of different costs involved with these decisions. And we um, had battery electric vehicles, you know, aren't cheap. And we were comparing the Bolt, which is by Chevrolet to the Toyota Prius. And so it wasn't a very fair comparison, I guess. The Bolt has more bells and whistles than the base Prius does. 
Uh, and so in any case, that, that was what we were comparing here, but we were adding technology somewhere between 5,000, maybe long term to add that technology to $25,000 uh, shorter term per vehicle. And batteries, you know, uh, still cost uh, more than $100 new per kilowatt hour installed on your vehicle. Um, but that number is falling over time. So some people expect it to go to $75 at some point or maybe lower. And then there's vehicle maintenance and cleaning and that adds up insurance and registration, all these different costs and the charging stations, um, it's, it's complex. Uh, but we, we looked at three different scenarios, high and low cost scenarios, and this is the, the mid-range cost scenario for all those um, settings that I, I showed you earlier. And you'll see, remember that 44 cents per mile that the average American is willing to pay for an SAV? The hybrid fleet, that, that Prius was able to get by at about 45 cents per mile, um, pure cost. And this is actually less than what transit agencies generally pay as subsidy for your and my um, miles, uh, passenger miles on, on the bus and the trains around the US. So this is, this is quite low. Um, and then it's about 60 cents per mile almost for any of those EV uh, settings with the, the Chevrolet Bolt as the base vehicle. So um, unfortunately, the all electrics couldn't compete without subsidy in, in our, our um, analysis. Uh, but they, they did all make profits, but the biggest profits per day were, were showing up for that, that Prius fleet here. So in conclusion, this uh, connected and autonomous vehicles, you know, do offer a lot of safety benefits as well as mobility benefits and, and, and maybe some parking benefits in a shared fleet, hopefully not, um, you know, letting your car go self-park itself. Um, but that does add vehicle miles traveled and congestion unless you have a lot of ride sharing. And, and of course, as smaller vehicles are more efficient. They also add less congestion because they don't occupy as much space. They, they save a lot of parking. They open up some new land for development in, in expensive settings, uh, downtown, for example. And ultimately, the cost is um, within the, the purview of our transit agencies, although they can't give all of us this option, right? They presently serve, you know, maybe 5% of the, the population's travel needs. And so um, all of us would be very interested in this door-to-door on-demand service. And there's no way the transit agency can um, provide all that given um, the current, I guess, sales taxes that, that go generally to their coffers. But they certainly can protect the most vulnerable among us with much better levels of service than we currently see on most transit um, lines. And, and, and without adding a bunch of congestion, you may be worried, you know, you want these big whales of buses out there, which is, you know, one expensive driver at the front versus these small uh, vehicles. We've simulated that too, that paper's at my website. And it's interesting to see the more nimble vehicles, even though there's more of them, they save a lot of time and they don't really um, add all congestion even though there's more of them. Uh, but they do add empty VMT, you know, just like buses add empty VMT, those buses running around empty or near empty, or they go back to the depot empty, these kinds of things. They, they sit and idle empty for worker breaks. Um, so we already have this kind of um, waste going on. And, and of course, parents drive their kids to school and all these things and then have to drive back the other way to get to work. So there's a lot of you know, sort of dumb travel already going on right now. Um, so it's not like we're free of this kind of waste. Um, and by having a, a better, a right-sized fleet rather than a bunch of pickup trucks and SUVs, um, you can have, you know, lower emissions as well as lower costs. And, and most people who are ordering a vehicle for, you know, single use, they don't care what size it is. But there can be pickups out there. So one day I may need to move a mattress and I decided not to own a vehicle that's big or own any vehicles and I can order a special SAV just like I can order a special lift vehicle right now that's that's big and can probably handle my mattress or I can go to Home Depot or or Lowe's of course and rent a vehicle or, or Hertz um, if they're still in business. So the COVID has been very hard to a lot of businesses, especially those um, focused on tourism. I do think congestion pricing is still and, and has long been needed, but the, the cost uh, and the technologies are now there to make this really um, cost effective. So you want to have GPS on board the vehicle, you want to have a, a device that's keeping track of how much it owes, regardless of where it is. It doesn't have to have overhead gantries. 
And of course, Singapore has just uh, shifted now to its next gen pricing. So Singapore had these gantries, they weren't very large um, and they were usually covered with shrubs and stuff because it's such a tropical climate. So they weren't that, that ugly as we have here in Texas. Uh, but the, Singapore is very tough with its fleet. You have to pay, uh, I think about $60,000 or more just to own a vehicle and get a, a medallion for maybe seven or eight years of use. And then you lose it and you have to go back to the auction. And so people are really loving having their uh, ride hailing app, which is not one of the big ones that you and I have heard of, but it functions just like it. It's very seamless and they have excellent transit because all that money, the, the few vehicle owners pay to, to have access to a vehicle that goes into uh, public services like transit. And they um, also are charging by time of day on congested links and they have citizen oversight to help make those decisions about whether the price should go up or down and it's decided ahead of time based on kind of historic traffic for a Wednesday afternoon in the middle of June. And, and so the prices are known ahead of time and they, they get adjusted maybe every three months as needed. So they're not purely um, congestion related or dynamic, which is provides some guarantee and some reliability for the travelers. But uh, that will help fill those seats. I think that'll make ride sharing a lot more popular. You can do it today. You don't need an autonomous vehicle. You, you can just add Waze carpool to your phone and you can find um, other people who are hopefully advertising um, trips in their own private vehicles at, at 50 cents or less um, per mile. And uh, unfortunately not enough people do it and advertise where they're going for that to, to have much of a market, but it is certainly technically feasible. We just need to get behind it socially. So I, I think I presented about 10 papers today. There's uh, many more at my website and I love to try to answer these questions. I'm sorry I haven't been able uh, to, to see the, what's go been going on here in the Q&A box, but I think Jason can help me with this. Yeah, that's right, Kara. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think what we can do now is go ahead and shift to the Q&A. Uh, it looks like we already have some questions there. And I think what we're going to do, um, if you're not familiar with the Q&A boxes, if you look with inside the, the, the Zoom app, um, towards the bottom ribbon, you should see a Q&A link there. And then uh, for those who have already typed questions, uh, other participants have the opportunity to upvote a question. And so I think what we'll do is we'll just... Um, start to work through those questions and those that have more upvotes tend to get moved towards the top of the list. Uh, so having said that, um, I invite you to go ahead and think about uh, questions you might have or look at those that are already there. And we can start with a question from uh, Ting Zhang. And it really, I think, is kind of bringing two things together in terms of how consumer behavior might be changing right now with respect to COVID and people's just general willingness to sh uh, ride share right now in the situation. How might that uh, affect uh, the modeling and results that you have, Kara? Right, so right now, of course, a TNCs, these transportation network companies, as California has termed it, are, are doing poorly, right? Um, unless you're really dependent because you, you don't have a vehicle or you don't have a license, uh, they are not doing well. And so those people have to be absorbed into other jobs in the economy. So maybe they're doing shopping at the grocery stores and dropping off that food for you or, or making it available curbside. So COVID has, has really um, affected the gig economy as well as, you know, tourism and, and the fine arts and, and all sorts of things that require sort of face-to-face -face experiences. Uh, so I do think this is going to be behind us. We weren't sure at the beginning whether they would be able to find vaccines, but it does seem very hopeful now. And I think with large scale vaccination, it's going to probably return to normalcy until another <laughs> virus rears its ugly head. So um, some important policy changes, maybe on wet markets in the Far East and um, how, you know, it, humans are encroaching on animal habitat and, and causing horrific loss. So we, we deserve, you know, to have our numbers reduced, I think, to some extent. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I think with fewer people, you know, driving to work long term, they're going to get habituated to being at home, there will be less demand, and there'll be less congestion. Uh, but there will still be people that that definitely want to pay others for a ride. And, and all of us, I think, are 
um, almost all of us, there's a couple die hard, you know, I will never let go of this steering wheel people out there, but um, almost all of us will really enjoy having somebody else drive, even if it's a computer driving us in the future. So, um, and, and there's, there's certain ways to clean vehicles, you know, if, if you're concerned, but I think your vaccination is going to really uh, make that sort of a, a big non-issue in, in the future. And, and that's going to be resolved well before these vehicles are, are widely available to us. I hope that helps. Yeah. So it looks like we've got a question here um, from uh, Kenneth Small uh, related to kind of a technical question on actually estimating demand and specifically induced demand by time of day uh, and whether or not that's feasible and how that might help predict the congestion impacts. Yeah, yeah. So travel demand modelers, you know, often have just four times a day or five times a day in their traditional models, but these dynamic traffic assignment models have departure time embedded in them. And so destination mode, route, and departure time are flexible in the latest code that we're using. One thing we didn't like about MatSim was that it didn't uh, have destination choice. It just took way too long, so nobody uses it. They had to basically turn off that flexibility. So I felt we were missing a lot of the induced demand there from choosing destinations that are further away because your value of time might fall in half. And instead of being willing to pay $20 an hour to not be in a vehicle, you might just say, well, somebody else is driving, so I'm just looking at my phone like I would anyway, or looking at my laptop or sleeping, and so I'm only willing to pay $10 an hour to get out of um, sitting in this vehicle. I'd rather be able, you know, like um, Star Trek, just be me to my destination. If I could do that, that's how much I'd be willing to pay to make this trip faster. And so that has big impacts. Um, and yeah, I, I think we, we definitely have always tried to include that in our models. Matsim didn't let us do the destination choice, but the dynamic traffic assignment is in there based on activity based models. And so they've got the whole itinerary and, and desired tour. Um, and then they can even restructure that tour, um, swapping certain things out in favor of others. Um, so the, I'm using Josh Ald's code, code now. He's at Argonne National Lab. It's called Polaris. I'm afraid it is proprietary. So Matsim is not, but we are using Polaris now as much as possible by collaborating with Argonne. So it looks like a uh, potential next question here is actually kind of two parts. One, it's re kind of related to uh, the general adoption rate uh, for specific companies to maybe use some of this technology and in terms of moving food and groceries around. Um, and then the second part of that question is uh, consumers' views on having their, their goods uh, shipped to their home through the self-driving uh, uh, cars. And, uh, you know, I, I can imagine uh, maybe being somewhat cautious about calling vehicles to come into your neighborhood as an example if you got kids out playing but thoughts on that question yeah well they generally are not going to be authorizing large-scale sales of these vehicles jason unless your six kids are going to be safe and so they i think they want like at least a two to one uh, you know a 50 percent reduction in crashes per vehicle mile traveled for them to feel confident issuing more licenses on these vehicles or registering more of these vehicles. Uh, so right now they're still in testing phase, although I think Shanghai and Beijing may have, you know, a bunch and, and be moving forward. Um, so anyhow, I, I think your kids are going to be safe, uh, but usually they're, they will have somebody on the vehicle when there's a lot of freight and there's a lot of packages and especially for the drop off, right, or the pickup, uh, but it's usually it's a drop off. So there's probably going to be somebody in the back sorting through everything, getting ready for the next set of homes or businesses for the drop off. Um, I do think some of these shared autonomous vehicles that I'm talking about, they may also serve as a way to move parcels about and they can pay. Um, some of us can get our rides paid for by dropping off parcels. And once we become, you know, great drop offers, uh, you know, we will get five stars and, and um, Uber will let me ride its self-driving vehicle for free. Or really it would probably be GM and, and Cruise um, or Waymo and Volvo. So these partnerships that will um, allow us to use the shared autonomous vehicles, which are primarily for passengers, I guess. They've got seat belts and all that to also drop off some of the parcels. So 
Uh, I don't think you'll need to be awake or alert for that, that vehicle to arrive, but in commercial areas, um, so some businesses, you know, a little robot will come down the, the, um, the sidewalk and, 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 and drop off with, um, you know, a central person um, who is, I don't know, a doorman, let's say, for that, that business or somebody at the front desk will come out and grab whatever's in there with a code. Uh, probably to open that vehicle. So that's a very small vehicle. There wouldn't be a person on board. But for the UPS type deliveries, you know, you'll probably still have somebody in the back. It's just that he or she doesn't have to be paying attention to the road. They can work on other back office operations in between those drop offs. Okay. The next question, uh, it's kind of more of a, a consumer behavior or you kind of utility from driving type question. And so the idea that autonomous, you know, you're taking some of the, the decision making uh, out of the driver and putting it into the car, but yet that's not the way everyone's gonna wanna drive. Sometimes people wanna pull off and look at things. Um, and so it, I think this is just a general question about um, how might, you know, consumers really, really respond to these things or, or you know, how, how are these things going to be addressed within this type of, of world? Yeah, well, I know a lot of people who got their smartphone or their flip phone were like, I'm not going to need this. This is so silly. And they, they held out. And then they're, they were amazed at how useful this thing was. And of course, you can tell the vehicle to go to the lake. Um, or you can say, hey, if it's your own private vehicle, you can say, hey, stop. Um, that I just passed something and I realized I need that and, and it can turn around much like you probably would or if you anticipate it, if you see the leg before you get there, you tell it, I'd like to stop and route. And if it's planning, you know, if there's somebody you're sharing the ride with, it's probably not going to do that. Um, but if you have a control of that vehicle, you know, they can charge you for every minute or you can let go of the vehicle and there'll be a fee, maybe a dollar to let go of a vehicle earlier than the fleet operator thought you'd be letting go of it. So. There's a lot of things you can still do. Um, you just can't pretend to be a race car driver, which is what my son wants to do, unless you go onto a track. So you will still have that opportunity. Uh, there will be a lot of guys, uh, especially and maybe young 16 year olds like my son who want to go to a track and put on a helmet and practice you know, conventional driving at high speeds. Um, that I think is, is what some people will miss. Um, and, you know, their cities will come up with laws before rural areas do. So it may be that Austin puts a cordon and says no conventional driving within this cordon because we're trying to protect our pedestrians. We have a vision zero and we, we just can't have any more of these conventional drivers hitting pedestrians in our downtown. So, um, you know, it can be that that small, that limited, and it slowly expands as you see the benefits and, and you and I die off. And then <laughs> we've got this new generation of people who got used to this uh, early on. So. I think, you know, you, you still will have those kinds of options, especially if you own the vehicle. Um, but taxis, you know, they can stop and route and you can add stops and route, I think, to the Uber and, and Lyft apps right now. So there are, are ways. Uh, it's just if you're sharing it with someone else, then it gets tricky. Within the same question, um, there, there's some specific questions about the survey itself and whether or not you ask questions on trying to derive ut utility from driving. Um, I don't know if you've got any specific comments to, to make or to speak to that, that question. Across the five surveys, I think we did ask, you know, do you like driving? And um, I can't recall whether, you know, that variable was statistically and practically significant in some of our regressions. One would think, of course, it would be. That's going to be a late adopter. One of the problems with that variable is you're not going to have it for prediction in uh, the future. So generally, as a travel demand modeler, I, I wouldn't rely on something that's subjective. Um, I rely on age and demographics, things I can uh, witness and observe and anticipate better than that kind of feeling about whether you like driving. Um, but I do think that is something that we are losing in our younger generation. They have phones. So a lot of them aren't even getting their licenses and, until they're 18 or older. Okay. It looks like our next question um, is somewhat more of a forecasting the benefits types questions. Um, and it says, what are the potential factors preventing the forecasted benefits such as on energy safety and congestion? Um, I think this is, this question is really trying to get at 
potentially some of the legal issues around uh, autonomous or self-driving cars and um, I don't know, what are your, your general thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I think, you know, the safety is, is the big fear. And so that is part of why Waymo and others try to keep their speeds low. They don't want to be on the front of the newspaper. So they are, um, safety is the big one. Energy, of course, um, but that has, you know, the nice thing about these vehicles, we do have a whole paper about energy and emissions implications because there's all these back and forth uh, opportunities for saving or spending more energy and, and greenhouse gases, really. I, I think, um, you know, the electric vehicle is much more efficient than an internal combustion engine, by the way. Uh, but, you know, you have to get that energy from somewhere. So is it coming from renewables or is it coming from old high sulfur coal? We're retiring pretty much all those plants, so those coal plants. So you're going to get a, a cleaner vehicle over time if you buy electric now. And I, I hope you all will. Um, I, we have strong experience with them and, and they're fantastic. Um, it's especially the Tesla is just like a, a flying machine. It's something you've never maybe experienced, I, I suspect. Um, it's a very different thing and, and uh, gets like five miles per kilowatt hour. Uh, on our Model 3, we have the smaller battery pack. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so I think because there's so much automation and computerization on these vehicles, they're gonna be at least hybrid because they do need to draw a fair amount of electric power. And that's a really good thing. So our paper, looking at all the added demand and all these other issues, uh, tends to find that they, we will be losing greenhouse gases, thank goodness, but we really need to lose greenhouse gases a lot faster than we are, like 75% reduction. So we absolutely need to electrify the fleet and um, we need to get more renewables. So we need smart charging decisions. And unfortunately, most electric vehicles are, are charged largely at night and you know they've got eight hours, they only need two hours to charge, they've got eight hours to do it. So you can listen to the grid and, and find out when renewables are high. Uh, so I think on energy, we're in very good shape here. I think on safety, it's going to be hard to make a mistake there because um, I don't think they're going to allow the hacking. And there's so, such a diverse group of people at, at creating these things. And we've learned a lot from the aviation industry on their self-flying capabilities. They had some issues, but they did that autopilot decades ago. And um, yeah, they didn't have the firewalls in place that we know about. But of course, People are coming up with new techniques to hack systems all the time. So I think mostly um, you're gonna try to keep your communications a firewalled from your automation. And you generally don't wanna allow remote driving of the vehicle, even if that makes the manufacturer feel more secure because they can take over if something happens that it, it enables you know a route for somebody to get in. And they won't attack thousands of vehicles at once generally, but you know it's scary for an owner. This is also the issue people have with flying. They didn't want to get on an airplane because they were in control. Turns out flying is the safest mode. <laughs> um, but in any case, you know, people have these sort of irrational fears because control is, is very important to them. Um, but I, I can tell you, people were fearful when um, elevators became automated. So they got rid of elevator operators and people were scared to death. Like, how? what's going to happen? Uh, and of course, they did great. So I think you're going to find that that Safety is, is not a big issue. The big issue is going to be gridlock. And I've got a solution for that. I think Ken Small does too. Uh, and, you know, it's but credit-based congestion pricing, which is where all of the revenues that were charged for congestion abatement, they go back to the users. So everybody has a budget for travel. And it can be used on electric bikes and, you know, ride hailing and um, buses. And uh, it doesn't have to be used to drive your vehicle, your private vehicle during uh, congested times of day. And you can donate excess credits to, I don't know, parents who are working and have, you know, children and, and work far from home. You can donate your extra credits to those kinds of people. But uh, I think that's going to really help. That's the real downside. And so we, we really need to be much smarter about how we kind of manage our roads. There's another question here uh, specific to your Austin uh, simulations and whether or not um, you included trunk line mass transit and multimode travel. I also think I saw um, a question earlier in the chat section asking about what about different modes of transportation, whether or not public transit was in your modeling at all. So it's got somewhat related to this question here. 
Yeah, we try to always have transit as a mode, but what we don't do well at is intermodalism. So we, uh, you know, walk to the transit station for a mile or something, and then we take the red line uh, train, which is light rail here in Austin. Uh, and then we take an AV to get to our office and, and we do this all in reverse when we come back home. Um, so those kinds of options, the access cost is, is pretty simplified versus having these, these sub modes that would bring you to the main mode, which would be transit in, in Joseph's question. Um, we do have another paper or two now about uh, SAV fleets that are devoted to train stations. So they serve the local neighborhoods and go back and forth. It's not very efficient, I'm afraid, but it's better than losing maybe all your riders on the train that you spend a lot of money on and, and have them lost to uh, private automobiles door to door, for example. So we, we have been looking at that. It, it is super important in places like Chicago and New York and San Francisco where they have really big investments in fixed guideway transit. And, and can get some pretty high capacities. And um, yeah, there's a lot of rolling stock that we've invested in. It's, it's quite expensive. Of course, the subsidies to those, those lines is also something we need to question and we need to examine. Can we do this better by getting people into smaller, nimble, more demand responsive vehicles with high frequency um, and all, all electric? So electrifying our bus fleets, very important. Uh, fortunately, most of the light rail, I think, and, and, and a lot of our commuter rail is electric right now. There's another question about how um, the autonomous vehicles in general might affect public transport uh, or the use of them. And so I, I was thinking about this earlier. Typically, when you lower the cost of something, uh, you know, any model that I'm familiar with would suggest that, you know, it's going to be used more. But um, I guess as it relates to public transit, you you mentioned this earlier about big buses versus cars, but I think this is specifically about subways. So I don't know if you have any any thoughts uh, on that. Yeah, I mean we've already seen it in New York. You know, New York has a very ailing and uh, aging subway system, unfortunately, that needs a lot of investment now. Uh, so they they certainly have uh, lost ridership to Lyft and Uber. Uh, and, you know, taxis are very popular in that city and, and, and now the medallion is, doesn't have much value, I guess, because of the, the rise of these other um, ride hailing apps that are called by your phone rather than um, physically or by a uh, conventional phone. So I think, yeah, they, they're generally going to lose out. There are certain settings where it makes great sense, like if you have a heavy toll for driving, that'll help shift people onto the BART train um, between San Francisco and Oakland, for example. All you need to do is toll that corridor, but you know that can be economically inefficient and, and um, you know not, not so equitable for people whose destinations or origins are far from those, those stations. So it does require a closer analysis. Um, I did want to go back to the previous uh, person. It might have been Joseph, who also had another question I noticed in there, which is about congestion at the pickup and drop off spots. And this has been a big issue at airports. So a lot of us are walking, you know, into parking lots to try to find our driver to keep that curb, un um, I guess, relatively uncongested. So, um, you know, family members can pick up at the curb and um, ride hailing goes into the parking lot and you have to walk a bit to access that. And, uh, they're still paying a fee, uh, by the way, to access the airport, just like taxis do. Uh, but that is super important at places like convention centers and uh, city halls and, and maybe theaters on, on, on movie nights, you know, at, or a, a theater night at 8 p.m., something like that. So we um, have a, a recent paper out from Minneapolis-St. Paul where we took like the 100 most busiest uh, links in the system in terms of pickup and drop offs per linear foot and we made them leave. They weren't allowed to idle. So they could pick up or drop off, but they had to get out of there because idling is, is a big issue. And so, and I don't mean idling in terms of emissions. I, I just mean sitting still and loitering as a vehicle is a huge deal. So um, we made them head out to access parking lots, which uh, makes response times longer, I guess, because they have to get out of those parking lots to get to the next uh, call if they weren't already assigned one uh, and could just skip the parking lot. So it's a really big issue. Um, we're doing more and more on that. It's called pick up and drop off, P-U-D-O. 
And yeah, it's a really important topic. So that's a great question. And um, it still performed quite well, uh, but we didn't do it on every link. So they are allowed to loiter on most links in our scenarios. Okay, well, that looks like all, all the questions that we had uh, in the Q&A in the chat. So uh, maybe at this point, I'll turn it back over to Hai Feng and, and uh, see what he has to offer to us. Hello, uh, seems like uh, um, Kara is a fairly uh, fast speaker, so we're moving faster than I would, I would think. Uh, so uh, I'll take this opportunity to perhaps ask a quick question. Uh, I'm no transport expert. I'm an urban planner, basically, and uh, uh, we was, I'm interested in the, the impacts of automated transportation on the urban spatial structures. So Kara, do we expect a maybe more urban sprawl and less density because of this. What's your thoughts about the uh, the future of the city, uh, the urban density, urban spatial structures? Yeah, so it's a big concern. I have a master's in city planning, and um, so this was a big concern. I do a lot of land use modeling also. Um, that's part of how I, I got connected with regional science. And I, I expected, you know, a stronger response by those respondents in terms of moving farther away. And we've had similar surveys, uh, not me, but um, Pat Mokhtarian at Georgia Tech did a, uh, those kinds of questions for the state of Georgia. And I think she asked everyone, not just people who were planning to move in the near term, but she found maybe 15% thought that this would pull them further away from the downtowns and about 10% moving closer to the downtowns. And so it, it can kind of offset itself because it's not just a private automobile mode, it's also adding the shared automobile mode. So then the question becomes, well, how do the manufacturers release the vehicles? The Tesla, I think, is going to be released directly, although Elon did famously say, buy a Tesla and then we'll rent it from you so it can go self-drive and share other you know, rides for other people while you're at work if you wanna make money off your vehicle. Um, I don't know how many people are going to do that with their beloved Teslas, but uh, you know it is a possibility that private vehicles are sort of public. But the big issue is really checking those sensors and things if they get dirty. There's a, a lot of people in this industry, not Tesla, but a lot of others are, are feel that the code is pretty wonky and they need a lot of babysitting. They need to get those vehicles back to the depots so they can do some diagnostics on them and reboot the computers and things like this. Uh, so Tesla is, is defying um, a lot of that, but it's, it's not going all the way you know, to, to true self-driving, although it is starting to appreciate stop signs uh, and red lights, which is amazing, but it can make you know, some pretty horrendous mistakes. So I didn't buy the AV option on my Tesla uh, when my husband and I did that, um, but we have the option, we have the hardware, so we can always buy up if we feel one day that it is worthwhile um, and, and performs well. So it, I, I do think that it, the effects will be bigger than what our respondents said. We were only asking households. There's also businesses, right? And they're gonna be impacted. And when we did that list of all the economic industries affected, uh, land development was like number two, because to, honestly, it could be a, a huge impact. And, and that's, not, that's not good news for animals. That's not good news for the planet. Uh, but thank God these things are going to probably be electric. So um, we're predicting, you know, like 25% more vehicle miles traveled, but still maybe 40% a greenhouse gas savings, which is not enough to protect this planet, guys. We still, we've got to get down 70%, um, you know, kind of across the board. So uh, transportation needs to do more. And I think it can do that with um, right, well, we already had right sizing, let's see, so more shared rides, more um, pricing, credit-based pricing of those roadways, things like that to, to kind of avoid these, these sprawling scenarios that I, I think you're right, that it is more likely than the respondents were anticipating. All right, um, thank you, Kara. Uh, I don't think we have uh, more questions. Uh, so probably can conclude this uh, lecture. I, I would like to thank everyone for participating. Uh, just a last reminder, we have one more coming in two weeks uh, by Professor Park Madridge, uh, same time of the day, uh, August 11th, uh, and his, his lecture will be on the economic impacts of COVID-19, and I hope to see you again. Thank you.